Hello and welcome to the IAPB Eye Health and COVID-19 web series where we invite experts from across different areas of health and development to discuss key issues during the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm Jessica Cross Lawrence, the Head of Policy and Advocacy at the IAPB. Today's interview is part of a series of discussions to understand the way the eye health sector is responding to the challenges in operating the, during the pandemic and adjusting to the new normal. I'm delighted to be joined today by Jess Blakers from Light for the World, which is a leading global disability and development organisation and a key member of IPB. And before I properly introduce Jess, I should start with congratulations, um, as Jess has just been appointed as Light for the World's new International Director of Programmes and Advocacy. Uh, congratulations, Jess, what a challenging <laughs> but also exciting time to be taking control. And say that again. <laughs> <laughs> Jess has a background in global ethics and philosophy. Uh, she's been working for Light for the World since uh, 2011 in different functions from advocacy and awareness raising to coordinating a comprehensive program in Burkina Faso and finally joining the program management team focused on eye health and neglected tropical diseases in 2016. Welcome, Jess. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. Thanks. Thanks for having me. It's a, it's a great pleasure. <laughs> so, Jess, COVID-19 is obviously posing considerable challenges for all organisations, but particularly NGOs, um, many of whom have faced uh, significant financial pressures, their programmes being scaled back or cut, and in some instances, uh, even closures. How has COVID-19 impacted your programme of work this year and what have been the biggest challenges your organisation has faced during the pandemic? Um, thanks. So, so it, obviously, I think we're all facing huge challenges. I think the main two challenges that we saw that the pandemic is causing on the one hand is the scope of it. So it's probably the first time that any emergency kind of affected all of our offices, all of our programs at the same time. So it was sort of, you didn't really know where to look. Um, so that's the one side of it. And the other challenge is, I think, the uncertainty of the situation and the, the unknown character. Of, it's not a sort of a one-off, it's happened and it's over and we deal with it, but it's a, it's a, it's a continuation of, of, a, of, a, of a, and a duration that we don't know we just don't know what's going to happen so that was obviously something that was a huge challenge for the organization programmatically yes we had to delay some major programs so we had spent 2019 putting a lot of effort for example in planning a 10-year child eye health intervention in four countries so we were really excited about that and we were ready to to sort of get going and and we just saw starting off a program in this kind of context just just doesn't make a lot of sense so it's better to focus on other things uh, so we delayed that into next year and then other aspects like the limited travel um, just really showed us how dependent we are on other countries so if, if in our eye health program for example we had planned quite a lot of um, subspeciality fellowships which were not available in the countries where we work. So we had to sort of plan to send people and organize visas and flights and all of that. And, and then we either had to get those people back from where they were or um, just cancel that completely. So it just, it just, it is and has been really frustrating. And then obviously it has had an, an impact on the organization as a whole, on our donors, on our, on our staff. So it's just a very broad, um, we yeah we've 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 been relatively um lucky in the context that that, that we have a, s a strong foundation and that our donors have been extremely faithful to us and extremely flexible during this time so in that sense um yeah we've we've somehow managed to to, to deal with the with the challenges but it's been quite some <laughs> quite some excitement yeah and i I know certainly uh, for us, in fact, for both of us, because uh, we were, uh, you know, involved in planning for 2020, which was supposed mm. to be such a, 
uh, hugely significant year for the mm. sector and I, I personally was quite uh, disheartened when we had to scale back a lot of our you know country launches for example mm. and uh, certainly my travel to New York and other parts of the world all got mm. pulled and um, so it is yeah, a huge challenge to still keep that um, mm. momentum and you know sort sure. of push through and survive um, and I suppose related to that we've all had to obviously adapt you know the way mm. um, we deliver our work but also our organizational priorities during the pandemic um, what have the changes been that Knights of the World has made um, over mm. the last few months and what are the strategies that have been adopted to um, cope during the pandemic? Mm. Um, I think a, a main strategy is, has, has been, I don't know if you could call it a strategy or really an approach or a way of, of reacting, has been kind of the, 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 the speed, the reactivity and the flexibility. So pretty i think it was it was beginning of march where we got a call from our colleague in in ethiopia who is based in the in the ntb uh, regional referral hospital which is where we have sort of a central part of of our of our eye health program a national optical workshop in ntb that serves the whole country and that's where it's based in collaboration with the ministry of health and, and they just called us and said listen um the, the Entebbe Hospital is the isolation center for the whole country. So we have to stop everything and focus everything on becoming an isolation center for COVID. And it was sort of, of course, on the one hand, you think, what about our program? But it was very fast that we sort of had to react and say, okay, they don't have PPE, they don't have masks, they need bed sheets, they need, you know, hand sanitizers and, and, and even sort of food for the health workers who are going to have to isolate and stay within the center. So that speed and that sort of having our ear on the ground, listening to partners and then immediately reacting to, 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 to make kind of the difference that we could make has been really important. And I think funnily enough, we didn't really ask ourselves that question about should we, should we not, should we do something, should we not, they would just kind of went for it because we knew um, that we would be needed. So we knew that people with disabilities, including people with visual impairment, with visual impairment would just be um, left behind. Um, and and uh, in things like communication, in things like, like access to health, um, and that we really had to, to do something about it. So what we, what we did pretty fast again, um, immediately at the beginning of the pandemic already in March, we, had, we, we developed a multicultural program again at a speed that, I, I, that that we haven't really seen before and all of the kind it was a very sort of bottom-up approach where all of the countries were trying to define what they would what they need and what our, their, our partners need and how we can make the biggest difference and so we managed to sort of get this in an amazing sort of collaboration um, this kind of overall program that has kind of common roof but that could then be adapted to the different countries. And it's, it, that was for me an amazing um, experience to just see how much, is, how much could be done in, in, in so many places at the same time um, without us having planned it at all. Um, I think another thing we did as an organization um, was scenario planning. So we, to deal with, as I said at the beginning, this kind of unknown, uncertain future, we really looked at, okay, in the short term, in the mid term, what are the different things that could happen and how could those affect us? And that was really helpful. Um, and combine that with much shorter term target setting and much short. So, you know, we, 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 I think in NGOs, we, we like our three year and our five year strategy. Um, but, but we really forced ourselves to say, okay, what can we do in the next three months? What can we do in the next five, six months? Um, and that kind of gave us a, a bit of structure and focus and, and relaxed a little bit the, the, the pressure because we had clear, clear goals. And then I think finally the, the, the biggest, I think we've all went through this forced digitalization um, 
um, push that the, the, the pandemic brought, brought, it was relatively smooth in our case because we had quite a lot of people working remotely already. Um, but that's actually, I mean, been an amazing equalizer um, across the organization. I and mean, it's completely sort of, we always had these hybrid meetings where you had some people in the room and some people outside and, and it's just sort of leveled the playing field. Um, and yeah, that's been, that's been a, an eye opener as well. Yeah, and, and we've had a very similar experience because we have obviously many of our staff all across the world, but we had our London office. And even though you have, uh, we, we obviously did have virtual meetings um, before the pandemic, it wasn't quite the same as it is now. There's much more broader communication across the organisation, but also, you know, across the IP yeah. membership as well. Um, and it's meant that a, a lot of the kind of global activities that we've done, for example, within the United Nations, are so much more accessible because it's yeah. virtual than online. So most people couldn't make it to the high level political forum um, can now do so this year. So exactly. that's the exciting mm. thing about it. I think it's questioned the status quo, hasn't it? Sort of, we, we, we all, I mean, travel and, and, and the digital meetings have been a, is a perfect example. We've always known that we've traveled too much. We know that we should, and, 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 and climate change and, the, and, and, and all of these things. And yet, in our heads as, a, as, a, as NGOs and as a sector, I think this thinking that if we don't meet in person, then it's not gonna happen. Um, actually, a lot has happened. Um, and 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 as you say probably in a much more accessible way than than would have otherwise yeah i think that that's i think that that's absolutely right and and actually it's forced it's forced a lot of the people that perhaps we were trying to persuade who might have needed that in-person meeting to be more uh receptive to mm. you know actually that conversation happening virtually so yeah. uh, in some senses hopefully it will it will benefit our work mm. um, I mean that, that leads me nicely on to my next question which is really around the kind of change in the advocacy landscape mm. that has happened um, since COVID-19 I mean obviously we've talked about how everything has shifted virtually but it has also meant that COVID-19 has dominated the headlines, the global agendas, the yeah. political attention. Mm. Um, we had obviously a lot of kind of major global engagement opportunities for eye health um, and this year that have been postponed or, or slightly shifted in format. Um, how have you adapted your advocacy approach during the pandemic? Um. I'm, I'm not sure that we, we've, we've adapted the approach so much, probably more kind of the focus of the, of the messages. So the, the approach, I think we've always had this sort of collaboration partnership way of, 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 of doing advocacy. And I think clearly with IAPB and, and the work that we've been doing in the last couple of months, that's sort of definitely part of how we see um, ourselves doing advocacy. Um, so, so that's still very much in the center of, of, of how we do it. And I think that, as you were saying, the pandemic has shown even more that we, were, that we need to, to work closer together and to, and to coordinate and combine those efforts. Um, I think, as I said, I think it's more the content and the focus. So we, um, as, as you were saying, we obviously couldn't go to the ministry and launch the World Report on Vision. Unfortunately, that would have been what we, I mean, one of the things that we wanted to do in our program countries it just wasn't the right time and i think it was it was it was definitely kind of that conscious decision about what do we want to bother bother people with um at a time where they actually need to concentrate on 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 dealing with this huge unprecedented pandemic um and what would be counterproductive so i think that was the one thing taking a hard look about what do we actually, what can we do and, and what should we be doing in different ways? And I think there, the, the collaboration with IPP again, has just been great to sort of have those four where we can have those discussions, content and advocacy to just sort of think, think this through. Um, 
so so on the non covid direct covid um topics we've sort of stepped back a little bit for the time being um and then we have put a major focus on inclusion of persons with disabilities in the covid crisis so that sort of uh, the i mean inclusion has always been a is is um is our second main mandate area of life for the world so we really have taken the covid as a as the covid pandemic as a really a moment to to put the spotlight on 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 the need to include persons with disabilities and it i mean great to see that those um obviously your work and those messages have have got through because you can see within the WHO response but within you know the UN mandate and documents and things that yeah. they have produced on this topic it really does put you know persons with disabilities you know at the heart of the kind of response and recovery yeah. uh, framework to COVID-19 mm. so which I'm sure you know is because of your organization uh, and the efforts that you have done uh, to make sure that that's front and centre. So, oh, well done on it's, it. we're, we're definitely not not alone. I mean, there are lots of, including other IOPB members who who've been work, working on this as well. But no, it's been amazing. I mean, um, the, the 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 WHO brings out such clear guidelines on how to include persons with disabilities in the COVID pandemic is just is just brilliant, and we've been sort of translating them into lots of different languages so that they like local languages as well. So that's hopefully will help also the dissemination and the and and the awareness in the countries where we work. Um, I mean, one of the things that has become really clear from these conversations that IPB has been having with members but also with other people from WHO from the UN is that iHealth really does have a role and indeed quite an important role both during and as we emerge and recover from the mm. pandemic. Um, what do you see as the role of iHealth but also iHealth organisations as um we obviously adjust to the new normal mm. but also start to think about building back better from the current crisis mm. um i mean i guess i guess to, to to look at it from a from a from a silver line silver lining perspective i think if if the pandemic has shown anything it's shown how important health systems are and strong health systems are not only for people's health which is kind of logical conclusion but also to people's education employment you know to the economy as a whole not only for that country but for the whole world so i think that is the silver lining if there is one i think is is how important is health um so that's it that's i think an opportunity for all health issues including eye health um i do think the the ex there's a little bit of an existential crisis as with the speed at which eye health has been delegated to the non-essential services um and i think certainly i felt and i think it's others in the eye health sector probably felt the same as i like thought we might have been at a different stage of that sort of that speed of right you are non-essential and even if that means that people have gone blind during this pandemic because there were no services and if that's not essential then i you know um at the same time, I think it just it's just a call for action for us again um, to say, OK, we haven't yet gotten that message across that clearly on how essential eye health services actually actually are for the, the, the whole of society and for people's for people's whole well-being, life, employment, education and and for the wider economy. And I think that's that's a, that's a call for action. And I think. The, the 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 opportunity that we have is again i mean we've been talking about integration and coordination for 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 a long time now but i think again it's it's just reinforcing that message and i think we we've been we've been going in the right direction it's it's when i don't think the u turn is necessary but just kind of redoubling our efforts to 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 make people understand why i have is so important but also how we can we can be part and parcel of the of the recovery phase, and I think uh, probably they're thinking a little bit outside of the box of who do we need to be working with, so that hopefully 
when health is given sort of a center stage, which it deserves, um, that, that, that eye health is sort of, yeah, part of the band, <laughs> you know, on the stage. Um, I think I think that's what we we need to be working towards, and that's how I, I I feel sort of yeah we've been we've been we've been taking the right steps we've been walking on the on the right direction but but this, but I think we just need to 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 redouble the efforts and 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 follow this new momentum that it's giving us um, and then I think as we said before um, on 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 inclusion of persons with disabilities I think again every crisis just underlines what is already there, right? So, and I think this pandemic has just shown again that certain groups are systematically excluded and systematically left behind. And I think there's no excuse left for the eye health sector to not be inclusive, whether it's of people with disabilities, women, men, children, people living in rural areas, or to be as inclusive as possible and as wide reaching as possible. Um, together with the with the ministries with with whom we work, which is of course the the tension that we're always in. Sort of who, how do we reach the people within the health system and within within sort of the the the, the setting that we have? Yeah, I think that's that's right. There's the the risk that we fall further down the priority this but there's also you know an opportunity to really integrate ourselves into you know whatever the kind of new uh approach and response will will be so i think mm. it's right that the sector needs to be conscious of that and then take hold of that and and mm. push forward and it's not it's not new to us so it's all the things that we have been saying for is quite some time and it's all the things that have come out of work report on vision but also yeah. more broadly you know the work that we've done around eye health and the sustainable development goals as well so exactly mm -hmm. yes i think we can feel optimistic i, I hope absolutely um, and and i think i think I, I just wanted to say i love the the the, the ivb motto for 2020 with hope in sight i think i think that's brilliant and i think that's how i see that's how I feel about 2020 and about 2030. There is there is hope, um, and and I think yeah, we just need to make sure that we're sort of part of the that we're part of it. Maybe we need to get louder. Maybe our messages weren't clear enough or weren't reaching the right people. And I think again, are we questioning the status quo? And I think that's that's maybe again another silver lining that the sort of we're having a forced review. <laughs> for sort of evaluation and sometimes that's helpful yes yes it's definitely forced us to do to do many things this <laughs> exactly. pandemic um and that really brings me to my last question which is you know really if you could share with us i guess your top two or three uh lessons learned um from your organization of together the things that you've already touched upon mm. um, I think it's 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 underlying things that we probably knew already but the but the but the what that, that 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 gets that maybe slip from time to time I think the one thing that jumps out is oh we we're really resilient animals so so it's surprising how much is possible in, and 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 generally more than we think. So so a lot is possible. There is a resilience that is there. Um, if if we sort of again try and navigate the, the the pandemic as best we can, I think that's the one thing. The other thing, as I said a couple of times, was this this forced review, this forced evaluation, this forced question in the status quo. I think if again this is sort of my philosophy background but if you if you if if we often sort of do the same thing over and over again without questioning is it actually possible in a different way um then then yeah how how are we are we seeing the progress and if there's no progress maybe we we just have to 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 to, to stop and think about it in a in a disruptive manner and in a in a 
in innovation and yeah transformative manner to say well this doesn't work so let's let's do it differently and make make bold steps and i think the pandemic has forced forced us to be bold in areas where where maybe um with we're thinking well we're doing fine so let's just continue business as usual um and then i think the last and and <laughs> It, it might seem a little bit sort of classic, but I, I do think that again, it, it just shows again and again and again that it's the people that, that, that are the sort of the proof of the pudding at the end of the day, and then it's the people who make the difference. And, and I think certainly in our case, it was, it was the, 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 the collaboration and the teamwork that, that gave in these difficult times the sense of purpose and the motivation and the sort of breath to, to to keep going because it's been it's it we've we've needed a lot of um endurance during this time and and i think yeah it's really it's really been that kind of closeness even from within the organization and with other organizations like IABB, just to know that we have those people with whom we we can collaborate and that we sort of we're in this together kind of feeling um was brilliant and and if 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 i may just sort of shout out to the to the whole team at night for the world at this point because they've just from the people in the field who were you know distributing food items to mothers of children with disabilities to the guys in vienna who were making sure that we can talk to each other um it's just it's just been really 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 great to see that kind of team spirit coming together <laughs> yeah, I agree. And, you know, I don't think I've ever felt this greater sense of community you know, mm. within the IFB membership. That's something that has become apparent you know, during yeah. the pandemic. Um, this brings us to the end of our interview. Um, Jess, thank you for joining us today and sharing your insights um, with us. Uh, I thank you to all of those who are watching. We, we hope that you have found this useful. And as I mentioned, um, we have uh, more of these, a whole series of these uh, webinars available um, on our website. So please do um, come and see our resources um, and um, visit our social media channels. Um, thank you very much.